Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's just reach over and touch your neighbor and pray for him right now. Hallelujah. Just pray for him right now. Hallelujah. Every need in my brother's life, every need in my sister's life, meet it, God. Every need, Lord, let it be ministered to. Every longing, let it be ministered to. Oh, yes, Lord. Minister to those in need, oh God. Minister to those who need a breakthrough in their worlds, oh God. Pull down every stronghold that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Set at liberty the bruised, oh God. Hallelujah. On the last evening before his crucifixion, Jesus preached a revelatory message concerning the establishment of the church as a productive, as a growing church. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth or pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. But then verse 7 said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done. Unto you. The expositor writes here is the true vine. Jesus is the source of all life. Jesus identifies two types of branches, fruit bearing and barren. Appearances can be deceiving. The ones not bearing fruit may look like the other branches for a while, but their failure to yield any harvest shows that they're not. These will be removed and thrown into the fire the last day. My subject this morning is this. If I abide in you, if you abide in me. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm asking you to help us today to be able to share your word in a way, Lord God, that can be easily understood. Asking you to help us to grow, Lord, from this word today, to mature, Lord, from this word today. Understand, Lord God, that you're in charge, but we're a part of the process, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. You know, it's one thing to have Jesus abiding living within the many members of the church body. It's another entirely for the body at times. This doesn't happen always, but at times we can be negligent in our responsibilities of abiding in him. Let me reveal how it is that we can actually have God enter our lives or abide within us 
Now, basically, it goes like this. First, we must humbly repent. I mean, we, for us to even come near to God, we've got to make sure that we get the sin out of the way. And so we've got to repent. We've got to ask forgiveness. We've got to die out to our sins. Simply because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yet repentance isn't enough. We next must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And then comes the infilling of the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit dwells within. God begins by abiding within us. Yet after having God in us, now it's important that we begin living a godly lifestyle or abiding in Him. I've seen people through the years who were, I'm talking about powerfully filled with the presence of God. The blood of Jesus had been applied and and for these things to occur, the receiver had to desire for God to come into their lives. Yet after Jesus comes in, here's the next question. Now what? The now what is we should make the decision that we're going to abide in Him. After salvation, this abiding in Him business is really where the rubber meets the road. After God's forgiven us, after God's remitted our sin, after He's filled us with His Spirit, are we going to make the decision that we're going to walk in Him, we're going to follow His directives, Wherever you lead, God, I will follow. Is that what we're going to do? Because that's really what it's about, to abide in him. So often we think a whole lot about what God can do for us, and yet God might just be thinking about what you're going to become for him. What you're going to do, what are you going to do for him? Matthew chapter 14, John the Baptist has just been beheaded by Herod. John's body was then buried. Jesus learns the news, and in verse 13 of Matthew 14, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. I want you to take note of this now. When Jesus hears the news about John's beheading, in his mind, he said, I- I've got to get away from everybody and everything. I've got to be alone. And yet the people, the needy, simply would not allow this. And I'm not talking about his closest here. I'm talking about people that had heard about his miracle working power, that had heard about his delivering power. And he's wanting to get alone and be by himself and deal with the loss of one of his beloved Friends, and yet, and yet the people said, I've got a need here, and I've got to deal with this need. Well, hallelujah. Let everybody just praise the Lord and magnify God for a minute. That's okay. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's okay, baby. Everything's good. So he said, I've got to be alone. And yet the people, the needy, would not let him be alone. Verse 13 then said, and when the people had heard thereof about him, you know, kind of moving away and getting, getting off to himself, they, and they, they continued following him on foot out of the cities. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send these multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals or food. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. They say unto him, We have here but five loaves, two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and they were all filled, 
and they took up the fragments that remained, 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Now, you know, in the natural, I just think a little funny sometimes. I'm saying you couldn't feed. There's no way you could feed Louisiana folk on two fishes and five loaves. <laughs> but there was something miraculous that took place here because when he'd break off a piece of fish, another fish, piece of fish would grow in its place. When he'd break off a piece of bread, that bread that had been broken away began to fill in that empty spot. And I, I'm telling you what, um, it, it, was just, it was just a miracle of unparalleled proportions. So all of these people, I'm talking about 5,000 people come together and he's taught now the miracle has happened, yet it's not 10 chapters later that we find the betrayer Judas leading Rome to the Lord. Then comes Jesus' horrible scourging. Next comes his crucifixion. Then his burial. Finally, his resurrection. Now remember, Jesus had said in times past, tear this temple down, speaking of his flesh, yet in three days I will build it again. And this is exactly what he did. Jesus came from the grave and he said that he would. And so just what he said, that's what happened. And there were many proofs of this. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 11, we find, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned him and said, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene then came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus. So he's risen, and now he's coming back, and he's appearing to those that have seen him go. So the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fears of the Jews, came Jesus, and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hand. He showed unto them his side. Then were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. He said unto them, except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And you say, well, he's lost his shot. After eight days, verse 26 said, again his disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Hallelujah, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. This is but another proof of Jesus' resurrection. 
The Apostle Paul himself spoke clearly about Jesus' resurrection being the genuine article in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve apostles, After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some have fallen asleep or passed. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of time. So Jesus dies. He's buried. He then comes alive. And for 40 long days, Jesus shows himself to many. And it's here that the Apostle Luke begins to record the actions of the apostles. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, we find the former treaties or record have I made, O Theophilus. The Theophilus spoken of here refers to one considered to be a friend of God. Again, the former record have I made of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Until the day in which he was taken up after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So his closest are in Jerusalem. Jesus told them, stay there. Then in verse 13, we find, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Verse 15, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. Now, I've said all of that to say this. I want you to really think about this. 500 at one time witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. Cephas, the 12 apostles, witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. Then Jesus appears to the 12 again and even again. And during one of these appearances, he convinced the one known as Doubting Thomas that he was, in fact, the crucified Messiah. Later, Jesus appears to the Apostle Paul. Here's my point. There's no telling how many thousands of miracles, healings, deliverances Jesus performed while walking this earth. And yet when the day of Pentecost rolls around, there was only 120 gathered together in the upper room waiting on the pouring out of the divine spirit. You see, it's one thing for Jesus to abide in us. It's another thing entirely for the church, the bride, to abide in him. Let me read it again. John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, or he pruneth it that it may bring more fruit. It's not that it's not being productive. He's just thinking this branch can be more productive. So I'm going to prune it. I'm going to make it to where it can bring forth a whole lot of fruit. 
Verse 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. That sounds like a two-way street that we ought to be living on. The word abide in our reading comes from the Greek word manah, and means to dwell, to continue, to tarry. Uh, one might say, but I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost long ago. I was buried in, by baptism in the name of Jesus Christ long ago. I under, understand, this is my point, I understand what was. The question isn't what was. The question is what still is. What does your relationship with God look like on this day are you abiding in the Lord are you dwelling with him faithfully are you abiding continually are you about the business of having a near relationship with him or have you settled for a distant relationship when I think about this abiding in Jesus business I think about the apostle John who was the only apostle of the Lamb that was not mortared. Every one of them was killed except for him, for the name of Christ. I believe Alex got a picture of Patmos. It's really a barren, windswept, I'm talking about it's just barren. There's nothing hardly there. It's just a rock out in the middle of the water. And the reason John was there was because the Roman emperor was doing all that he could to totally wipe out Christianity. It was also here that John saw on one day something that he would never forget. The apostle writes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt with, about with paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters." And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell down at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And guess what? I also have the keys of hell and of death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, church, we often place the apostles of the Lamb on a pedestal for their dedication to the Lord 
However, I want us to understand this. It was not their mission in life to be placed on a pedestal. Their mission was to place Jesus on the pedestal. Jesus made his abode within them. He walked with them. He talked with them. He directed them. But this wasn't the end of their union. The apostles also made their abode in him. Their lives were centered around him. Their commitment was found in him and through him. And their relationship with him was revealed to multitudes. How do you think this church was furthered? It was because these men of God created, I'm talking about preached and and, and gathered others into into the barn of salvation, if you will, and turned them into preachers. And then the gospel was shared. And all of a sudden, you've got got multitudes that have repented of their sins, have been baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. These never, I'm talking about the apostles, they never forgot the words of Moses found in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart and with all of thy soul and with all of thy might. And so I come preaching this morning. If we will give ourselves to abiding in God, to walking in the Spirit, to being obedient partners. There's nothing that will limit our ability to be used of Him and blessed of Him. If we will give ourselves to abiding in Jesus, we will without question triumph over the gates of hell, the powers of hell. We will also obtain the heavenly treasure found in the form of souls that were bound for a burning devil's hell, yet now they're bound for streets of gold to view walls of jasper and gates of pearl because somebody said, I'm going to abide in him and I'm going to share some of what's in me. I'm going to let people know that they don't have to go to hell They don't have to be in torment for all of eternity. No, they can live in heaven. They can live in peace. They can live in joy. They can live in all of the things that God has prepared for them. Jesus is saying to us on this day, if I abide in you and you abide in me, eternity will not only be better, eternity will be revolutionized. People that that were heading headlong off into a burning devil's hell can be rescued from hell if we will make up our minds to abide in him. Hallelujah. I want to ask some questions here today when you sit down in a restaurant to eat. What do you see there? Do you see a waitress? Do you see just people sitting at tables? I'll tell you what, you need, we need to get to the place where we see souls. We need to get to the place where we see people that, that are living their lives with none of God many times, don't know anything about God, and yet unless we live in him, uh, he can live in us all he wants to, but unless we live in him, we're never going to begin reaching out and touching lives, and hopefully changing those lives. (laughs) Hallelujah. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. I'm talking about a man that wrote half of the New Testament, and yet he's got a thorn in his flesh. The messenger of Satan is working him over every single day of his life. And the whole reason that messenger of Satan was allowed was to keep him humble. 
lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me, and all God would say to him is, My grace is sufficient for thee. Now, wait a minute, God. I wasn't expecting this. It's going to be okay, Paul. You just got to keep living the life. You got to keep praying. You got to keep seeking the face of God. You got to keep drawing near to me. You got to remember, I abide in you, but you got to abide in me too. You've got some more mission to do. You've got some more things to do. So keep writing your letters. Keep affecting the world. I besought the Lord thrice. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Somebody needs to hear me today. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, when this old flesh is minimized, then am I strong in him. God, there's got to be more of you. Than there is of me. God, you abide in my life. You filled me with your spirit 46 years ago. But am I abiding in you? Am I pursuing your perfect will? Am I doing what I was called out of this world to do? Am I reaching for the lost? Am I hungry for a soul? And they asked, but what in the world was this great husbandman? What was the uh, Almighty doing? What was the husbandman doing with the Apostle Paul? Paul had borne so much fruit. My goodness, he had reached souls. He had reached souls. He had established church after church after church after church. And yet God would not leave Paul alone. God, I don't care how much fruit he had on the branch, God was just snipping it off so that more fruit could come forth. You say, well, I do what I do for God every week, and that's all I got time to do. I, I'm sure that's what Paul said at times. I've done all I can do for God. And God said, no, we're going to prune you a little bit because there's a whole lot more I want you to do for me. There's a whole lot more people I want you to affect for me. And you say, well, I'm going through this and I'm going through that in my life. I just believe if you're a saint of the living God and all this stuff is going on in your life, that God's just got the pruning shears out. And he's saying, wait a minute, you can be greater than you've been. You can be more than you've been. You can be something dynamic for the kingdom of God if you'll stay humble and understand that I'm never going to fail you. The point here is there can come times in our lives when we're doing well. There been times in my life when I was doing really well, really being faithful, really doing what I was supposed to be doing, yet out of nowhere... God just knocks me in the head. And again, it wasn't that I wasn't living right. It was instead that he knew that I could produce more. So all of a sudden, here come tests to my faith. And, and boy, he wants to see, are we going to lean on ourselves? Are we going to abide in ourselves, or are we going to abide in him? Are we going to try to do it all by ourselves, or are we going to trust him in times of trouble? His purging might come by way of, I mean, tragic circumstances. How, how many have in, had to endure tragic circumstances? But friends, those tragic circumstances get our attention so quickly. And God sometimes is simply reminding us, I want you to abide in me. I don't want you to get so caught up in hands-on involvement 
in, your, in all, of your, all of this world that you forget that souls are my primary concern. Let's look anew at the life of Paul. Purging brought the realization that his strength was made perfect where? In weakness. That God's grace was sufficient in the most difficult times of, of physical infirmity. He says, but I'm going through it. I'm a mess. My world is shaking. It's quaking. I'm in trouble. I have a question. Jesus is abiding in you. Are you abiding in him? Can he trust you to hold fast to the profession of your faith? We know he's abiding in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may have went to the prayer room this morning, prayed, prayed through and prayed in the spirit. And, but are we abiding? I'm talking about abiding in him, doing his perfect will, performing his perfect will. Because if we've got potential and we're not, he'll take out the pruning shears and he'll start trimming. Well, I don't like to be trimmed. I don't either. But then once he trims us, all of a sudden, here comes new sprouts. And all of a sudden, we're producing a whole lot more than we would have if we hadn't been pruned. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand. I have one final scripture for you today. Down in Psalm 27, 4, David writes here, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. Now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices with joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I Seek. I want you to grab hold of this today, church. This is a God, saint of God business. It's not just a God business. It's a God, saint of God business. And this God, saint of God business, it's a two-way street. Give and it shall be given unto you. Shake it, press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. It's a two-way street. Give and it shall be given. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, and I will exalt thee in due time. It's two-way street. Two-way street. Are we faithfully serving him? Are we obedient at all times? Or are we living by pushing panic buttons all the time? Someone said, Brother Sartre, I can do anything I want to do. And you're right, you can do anything you want to do. And yet, what does God want you to do? How does God want you to act? I'm going to let you in on a little secret here this morning. It's found in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. I want you to know God's taken each and every one of us someplace. And God is not about the business of beating our brains out. Let me read it again. For I know the thoughts that I think to you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and she shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, and when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm so thankful that 
Many years ago, you called me, God. I'm so thankful, Lord, sitting in the old church, about right where Brother Don is sitting in the old church. And suddenly that tongue and mess, that message in tongues came forth, that song in tongues, and boy, I, I don't, I, I don't even remember getting to the altar. And when I came to, I was speaking in that heavenly language. And, and I'm telling you, I didn't stop speaking in that language, heavenly language for a long time. God was now abiding in me. I had to have the blood applied. We drove over to New Orleans at a church that had the baptistry. We didn't have a baptistry at the time in the church. My daddy just took the church. And they put me under the water. It was freezing cold. Put me under the water in Jesus' name. But it didn't bother me a bit because the blood of Jesus had been applied to my life. I was abiding in him. Friends, salvation is one thing. Abiding in him is another deal. Living in him. Being obedient to him. Trusting him. When he says go left, I'm going left. When he says go right, I'm going right. When he said talk to that person over there, I'm going to talk to that person over there. When he said give that one a my five card, I'm going to give that one a my five card. When he says teach a Bible study to that one, I'm going to say, man, have you ever heard about a Bible study? I teach Bible studies and I can help you with that. I'm telling you, that's what abiding in him is all about. Making yourself a usable vessel. Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I will do. Well, let me ask a question today. Anybody feel like you just need to draw a little closer to the Lord today? If you feel like you need to draw a little closer to the Lord today, why don't you just begin coming? I'm not going to force anybody to come. But if you feel like I just need to draw a little closer to the Lord today, just step out and get a little closer to the front. Because we're just, we're just going to love the Lord today. We're going to love the Lord today. With all of our hearts, with everything that is within us, we're just going to love you, Jesus. And Lord, we're going to be obedient servants. Come on, come on. Don't block the aisles. Don't block the aisles. Just keep on coming. Just keep on coming. Just keep on coming. Keep on coming. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on, come on. Now lift up your hands to the Lord and begin to love Him with everything that is within you. Hallelujah, Lord. I know you're in me, but I want to abide in you, O oh God. I desire to abide in you, O oh God. I want more of you, O oh God. I've got to have more of you, O oh God. I've got to have more of you, O oh Lord.